let us be called into worship this morning from the book of Job in chapter 37. It says this, At this also my heart trembles and leaps out of its place. Keep listening to the thunder of his voice and the rumbling that comes from his mouth. Under the whole heaven he lets it go and is lightning to the corners of the earth. After it his voice roars, he thunders with majestic voice, and he does not restrain the lightnings when his voice is heard. God thunders wondrously with his voice. He does great things that we cannot comprehend. For to the snow, he says, fall on the earth. Likewise to the downpour, he's his mighty downpour. He seals up the hand of every man, and all men whom he made may know it. Then the beasts go into their lairs and remain in their dens. From its chamber comes the whirlwind and cold from scattering winds. By the breath of God, ice is given, and the broad waters are frozen fast. He loads the thick cloud with moisture. The clouds scatter his lightning. They turn around and around by his guidance to accomplish all that he commands them on the face of the habitable world, whether for correction or for his land or for love, he causes it to happen. This morning, we're not able to meet in person uh, because we felt it unsafe on the roadways uh, to meet uh, and drive out in, in this icy conditions. But even in this, we're reminded by the book of Job that God causes all weather patterns. God causes all things to happen, whether for correction or for his land or for love. God causes it to happen. He is in control this morning. and We love him and we worship him this morning. I'm so glad you're joining us virtually and I hope that you'll worship with us as we sing together. Well, good morning once again. I hope you are warm and cozy wherever you are. Uh, maybe drinking a cup of coffee and enjoying uh, this worship service this morning virtually. Uh, I do want to bring to your attention a few uh, announcements that are going to be going on this week. Uh, some things that, well, uh, of course, the weather hit at just the right time, so we should be back to normal uh, starting tomorrow. But uh, Tuesday night, we will have our monthly meeting down in the fellowship hall. This is the monthly business meeting of our church. Uh, so be sure that if you're a member of the church or you're interested in what's going on at the church, that you come to monthly meeting this Tuesday at 7 p.m. Uh, also, on Wednesday night, we will be having USFW at 7 p.m. in the Fellowship Hall. Uh, this is a ladies' missions group, so uh, if you'd like to join us th for Wednesday night at 7, we'd love to have you. Also this week, uh, The Well is going to be having their Mom's Night Out Thai cooking class. Uh, you still, if you want to come, uh, there's, you still have time. You can uh, let us know either by commenting on this video or sending uh, Megan a text or a message. Uh, by tomorrow, uh, we, this will be at 6.30 p.m. Uh, in the Family Life Center. We're going to be having a Thai cooking class, learning how to cook. Uh, the cost for, uh, for the church is $15 for this class. Uh, so if you'd like to be a part of that, uh, please, uh, please let Megan know. Uh, one more thing that I want to bring to your attention this morning uh, before we go into a time of open worship. 
uh, in speaking with some of ministry and council, uh, because we had to postpone our service today, because we had to cancel in person today, uh, we've decided that uh, we are going to postpone the beginning of hope groups. Uh, we don't know when they will actually happen, but uh, I, in my want, in my desire, I wanted to push forward, plow through, but uh, I know that that's not the best right now, and we've got a lot of COVID around us uh, along with uh, this weather, and so we, we are going to postpone the start of Hope Groups, uh, and we don't know when that will be. Uh, we're going to do it in God's timing when we feel that we're, we're right. Uh, one person reminded me this week that, uh, you know, we have to go by God's timing, and it seems like God's just saying not right now for Hope Groups, and he's been saying that for a little while, so we're going to postpone that, and we'll let you know when, when that will come back around. As you can tell in my voice, um, I have some kind of uh, drainage. Um, I, I'm going to go uh, and make sure that I don't have COVID this week, but um, I just started feeling bad yesterday. Uh, I was at home all day with the kids, so maybe they gave me something, a cough, a drainage, whatever it is, uh, but um, this morning... Uh, what we were going to do, what I had planned to preach, and what I had spent all of my time this week prepping was to talk about hope groups. And so instead of doing that, you've already seen we're using music that is old. I'm actually going to go back to the book of Ephesians, and we're going to look back at the sermon that we last preached in Ephesians. That was preached on the November 21st. Uh, and so it'll kind of get us geared up to start Ephesians back next week with Ephesians chapter 4. Now we want to enter into a time of open worship, and there are a lot of things that we can be praying for uh, this morning, and so this is just a time in your home right now to, to stop this week, to, to just hear from God, listen to God, and pray to God. Uh, if you have a prayer request or you have something that you'd like to share, please put it there in the comments, either on Facebook or YouTube. We'd love to hear from you and pray for you in any way that we can couple of names that I want to mention this morning as we go into this time of open worship. Uh, we want to remember R.D. Stroud. R.D. had a minor heart attack on Friday, uh, on Friday night, was taken to the hospital fr late Friday, uh, is now at Rex Hospital uh, there in, in uh, Raleigh. So let's be praying for him as they work on him. He's very stable and doing okay as well. I also want to remember Bill Weber. Uh, he has been in declining health for some time, and he he's just uh, was in the hospital this week as well, in the emergency room. Let's pray for him and Betty as well. I always want to remember Bobby and uh, Carolyn and Denny Sutton and many others who are on our prayer list. So let's go into a time of open worship now.
Father, you are so good to us. You make it rain on the just and the unjust alike, and we thank you for your grace that multiplies to us over and again. And God, this morning, I just pray that everyone that listens to this message this morning, that everyone that listens to this service this morning, God, they would know your presence, they would know who you are, Father, that you would be shown to them through your Spirit. God, I pray for many needs within our community right now. I, I pray for uh, RD, and, and I pray for, for Bill, and for Denny, and for uh, Bobby. God, there are so many people in our church right now that are hurting, whether from COVID or whether from other sicknesses. God, we know that you have a sovereignty over every situation, and God, we can rejoice because you love us, and you're going to work things out for our good. And whether that means that we are healed miraculously or whether that means we're healed uh, by being taken uh, to you, to live with you, God, I pray that uh, we would just know your sovereignty, know your love. God, I pray that you would bless uh, this time that we have together online, bless the time that, that we're going to, bless all the things we're going to be doing this week as well. And God, we just thank you for what you're doing in our church. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <laughs>
Well, good morning once again. We're so grateful that you've joined us this morning. And if you have your Bible with you this morning, please find your place in God's Word in the book of Ephesians. Ephesians chapter 3. Uh, we're going to be looking at uh, the end of chapter 3 this morning. And in fact, we're actually going to, after this week, be taking a break from Ephesians. Because uh, can you believe it? Christmas is is here. Advent is here. And so we begin the season of Advent next week, and we'll be uh, preaching through some selected passages in the book of Revelation uh, through the Advent season. And so uh, we'll be looking at Ephesians uh, chapter 3 today, and then we'll be taking a quick break. So uh, if you didn't bring a Bible today, no problem. There should be a black one there in the pew in front of you. I like to always uh, bring attention to those. Uh, Ephesians is on 976 of the large print and 917 of the standard version. I want to ask you a question. Before today, before this service began, when was the last time you prayed? When was the last time that you, and what I mean by prayed, I don't, I don't mean just like a little prayer over a meal. I mean really pray by yourself, just you and God praying. For some of us, it could have been this morning. It could have been we woke up this morning uh, early and prayed or last night or maybe for some of us still it has been a while think about that last time that you prayed what did you pray for what did you say to god How, what what did that prayer involve Maybe you prayed through a long list of names. You had a bunch of names that you wanted to pray for. Maybe you prayed uh, to bless a meal, right? Maybe for some of us here, the last time we prayed, it was because it was something, there was something huge happening in our life, and we uh, needed to pray. You know, there's a comedian that I really love by the name of Jim Gaffigan who tells a story about this, his own prayer life. He said he was in the mall one day, and he has four kids, and I can relate to that. Because uh, I, and two, have four kids. And one of them went missing. And so he's, he, he said, in that moment, I became really religious. Because my kid's missing. And so I began to pray to God. I began to say, God, if you just let me find my kid, I'll, I, I'll stop eating Wendy's. I'll stop eating all this awful fast food that I eat. I'll, he was making all these promises. And, and then all of a sudden, the middle of prayer, he's like, oh, oh there's my kid. All right, guys, let's go to Wendy's, you know. <laughs> We'll talk to you later, God. I'll, I'll, you know, we'll talk uh, when I get cancer, right? And some of us, that's our approach to prayer, right? It, when something big is happening in our life, we lose our child, uh, we, we get a diagnosis, or something's happening in someone else's life, we pray. But, but let me introduce a principle to you this morning. You, are you ready for this principle? What you pray for shows you and shows us what you value most. What we pray for shows us what we value most. And, and I would take that even a step further. What we pray for, yes, shows us what we value most, and how often we pray for that thing shows us how serious we are about it. And really, when we pray... There's really two, most of our prayers fit into two categories. Think about your prayer life. Think about the last time you prayed. There's, there's probably two things, two categories that you could put all of what you talked about to God in. And that is a prayer for an avoidance of pain or suffering. God, I, uh, this person's in pain, this person's hurting. God, just help them to get out of that. Help them to not feel that pain. Or, or God, keep me from, from feeling this pain. Or, or, or maybe the, the other category that I would use is a, for a change of circumstance. Most often, that's what we pray for. We, our, our prayer list at the church is full of people who, who need a change, need a, an avoidance of prayer. And, and there's nothing wrong for praying for these things. But our passage today, that we're going to be looking at in Ephesians chapter 3, it gives us a window into what Paul valued. If we're going to say that prayer and what we pray for in our prayers 
show us what we value, then this prayer that Paul prays for the Ephesians shows us what he valued most. And guess what? He didn't pray for an avoidance of pain. He didn't pray for a change in circumstance. He didn't list a bunch of Ephesians. He, he knew the Ephesians. He didn't list a bunch of their names and say, bless Paul and bless uh, you know, Peter, bless all the people in the church and, and make sure that... You no, know, he, he prayed for something specific. And I think today we need to learn from his prayer what we really should be praying and what we, how our prayer life should really take a huge change. So let's turn now to this prayer, to read this prayer that comes at the end, at the, the end of him talking about all of this rich theology of reconciliation between God and us and between us and other people. And as we do, as we come to this prayer this morning, let us stand in the honor of reading God's word. Let's read together Ephesians chapter 3. Beginning in verse 14. This is God's word. For this reason I bow my knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory he may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. That you, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations, forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is God's word. May he add its blessing to our heart this day. You may be seated. You see, here in this passage, we have a prayer. We have a prayer that Paul is praying for the Ephesian believers. And, and you see, he values something very different than many of us may value when we pray. He values, I mean, a lot of things. He prays very differently than we would pray. But remember that this verse, verse 14, begins the same way the beginning of the chapter begins. If you're there in your Bible, look, look with me very quickly. Uh, for this reason, it says in verse 14. And if you look back at verse 1, it says, for this reason. Well, if you remember last week, what was one of our plot twists from last week? That all of verses 1 to 13 are a parenthesis. They're, they're a, a kind of a, a gap in thought. And so here in verse 14, he picks up his thought again. And he picks it up uh, based on what he has said before. That God has done something to reconcile us to himself. He sent Jesus so that we could have relationship with God. And because of that relationship that we have with God, we can then exist within a church, within a body of other believers, and we can be reconciled to them. And so this thought is what's in his mind when he's saying, for this reason, he, he's saying, because God has, has saved you. So this morning, this prayer, right, in many ways is for those who are saved, who have, have believed in Jesus, are following Jesus. And we're going to see that, that this prayer, if you today have come into this place and you don't know God as your Father, you are not uh, following after Jesus, then you're missing out on many things that God can do in your life. These are blessings and, and, and things that Paul is praying specifically for those who are following Jesus. And look at what he prays. He prays something. He, he starts his prayer, right, by, by showing his posture during prayer. He says, for this reason, I bow my knees, right? And, and this is a very typical posture for us. But in, in his time, in Paul's time, that was not the typical posture of prayer. 
In fact, most of the Jews of this time would pray standing with their hands raised to God, and they would stand praying. If you remember the story that Jesus told of, of, the, uh, of the Pharisee who went into the temple to pray, that's the posture that he's taking. He's standing out and, and speaking very loudly, uh, Jesus reminds us. And, and then there's another guy, he comes and he stands towards the back and he beats his breast. And you, you remember this story that Jesus tells. Well, this is the posture of prayer. But, but look at what he does. He changes the posture to be on his knees. I bow my knees. I, 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 I con- I, in much, many ways, I put myself in contrition before the Lord. He got on his face before God. And I ask you... When was the last time that you bowed your knees and got on your face before God? He is bowing his knees for these, for these people, for, for them to, to have many things, but he's bowing his knees before the Father. And this Father, he, he talks about who this Father is, right? It, it is God, right? But look at how he talks about God here. For this reason, I bow my knees, I'm, I'm, con- I'm making myself low, I'm, I, I'm really pouring my heart out to God, to the Father. Verse 15, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. What, is, what does he mean here? He's bowing his knees, not just to, this is a very, he's making a distinction here. He's not praying to just some deity. He's not praying to uh, the government. He's not praying to Caesar, which would be uh, very uh, common in those days. He's praying to the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. And there's actually a play on words here in the Greek. It doesn't come out very much in the, the English as much, where he's literally basically saying, this Father from whom every father... Right, comes from whom fatherhood comes. And, and really the idea that Paul is uh, trying to get across to us and, and what he's calling God is that God is our source for everything. He's the source of fatherhood. Right? Sometimes we like to think of uh, God and we say, well, God is, is a father like I am a father. And that's not true. What is true is that we receive... The idea of being a father from God. He is the source of it. It's not something that we project back onto God. It's something that he has given us as a gift. Fathers. Families. He is the source. He is sovereign. He is the one uh, from whom all of our uh, sustenance, all of who we are comes. I invite you, as one pastor does, to stop for a second. Let's just stop. I do this quite often with Ezra and my kids. And just take a deep breath. That very breath that you just took came from God himself. It was God's decision to let you take that breath. He is the source of life. He is the source of all things. And from him come all things. We don't think about this too often. He decides our life. And, and I think we, we, we make so much about us. When you prayed last time, how did you start your prayer? God bless me, keep me, 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 me? Or did we sit and think for a second about how insignificant we are? For us type A's, like me, right, who are control freaks, this is a scary proposition. There's somebody else that's in charge of of my life that's directing my steps, 
No, no, no. It's me, right? I'm making these decisions. I'm doing the things that, uh, that you know, choosing my life. But really, God is directing our steps. Do you, you want to know something? This morning, it's not an accident that you're here. God knew you were going to be here. He knew who needed to hear what was going to be preached this morning. He knew who was going to hear what Haley said this morning, who, who, what the choir sang. He knew. God directed you here. You think, I, I made the decision to come this morning. I made the decision to, to, to uh, get out of bed this morning. No, God gave you the strength and, and the, put it in your heart to come here. It's not an accident that you're here. And this father, the, the one who, who has, is the source of all family, the source of all things, this is the God to whom we pray. And he shows us, right, in the next phrase, how all of what he's about to pray, God is able to do. Look at, look at the next verse with me. Verse 16. That according to the riches of his glory... He may grant you, and then he goes on to name four things, and we're going to look at those four things. But according to his riches, he's saying, God, he, he is the source of all things, and he has riches beyond our wildest imagination. The riches of his glory. Think about how rich God is. Have you ever stopped to think about that? If he owns, if he is directing all of our steps, if he was the source of all, I mean, he is perhaps the richest... I mean, he is. He's the richest being ever. You know, I don't often get to, and never probably have met, and maybe you have, a, a billionaire. Think about a billionaire and how much money a billion dollars, I mean, someone who is a billionaire. Think about the stuff they can do. I mean, just take, I mean, if you just took... A, a, a couple million dollars, you could change an entire community. You could eradicate hunger from, from a population of people. The resources that, that God has, or that, that person has, they can do amazing things. And if, if I were to ever meet a billionaire, I don't know, maybe I'll have that, maybe one of you is a billionaire and you're just like hiding the, all this money, right? But if I ever meet a billionaire, I mean, not, not to cater to that person or in any way, but if you look at that person, they just have a power that I will never have. I will never have the, the spending and buying power of a billionaire. But God has so much more than even a billionaire has. And, and here, Paul is bowing before this God who has, has, uh, is the source of all things, but indeed has riches beyond our wildest imagination. And so when we pray, do we actually believe that God has the ability to, to answer that prayer? Do, do you see how, when we look at the God that we're praying to, how trivial some of the things we bring to him are? Not that God doesn't want to hear us or, or doesn't want to hear from us, but think about that for a second. Think about the last time you prayed. You were praying to the God of, uh, of the universe. Sovereign over all. And what do we ask him for? Just make my life good. When we think of this God, it should change the very way that we pray. And notice, he prays for four things in this passage for, for these Ephesians believers. And, and he believes in praying these things that they will come to pass. And, and honestly, this week, I have prayed these things for you. Because guess what? I'm sick playing games in many ways. Because the things that we do and the things that we worry ourselves about in the church many times matter not at all. And I've been guilty of this thing. 
We're talking about matters of eternity. We have the keys to, to, to this God who is above all. We have the keys to eternity, and we, and we worry about these minor little detail things. I've prayed these for you this week. Because I, I, want, I want you to get it. I want, I, I want to get it. I pray this for me. I want to get it in a way that maybe I've never before. The first thing that he prays for here is found in verses 16 and 17. Look at it with me. He prays this. That according to his riches, this Father may grant you to be strengthened with power through his Spirit in your inner being. So that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. Now here he's not talking about salvation. He, you might have said, well, well Andrew, you, you've taught in the past that when you're saved, when you come to know Jesus, that uh, you, uh, you have the spirit that comes and dwells in you, and that is true. But there are times in our life when we can, we can what we call quench the spirit, where we can push the spirit aside. And what Paul here is praying for is that we would experience the Fullness, the, the strength that, that can come from the Holy Spirit living inside of us. That Christ would strengthen us in the inner person. And so this first prayer, and my prayer for you today, is that God would strengthen you in your inner person. The real you, right? The, not, not what we see, flesh and blood, and what Mr. Kagi can see a little bit better now. The flesh and blood, no. Well, we're talking about the real you, the one who has thoughts and emotions and feelings. And he's asking here that we would experience a strength, a supernatural strength. And for this context into which Paul is praying, it's very relevant. Right? We have Jews and Gentiles who formerly hated each other, and now they're trying to come together and, and, and be one group. And so what he's asking for is that they would be strengthened to be able to continue this work, to have compassion for one another. Because guess what? Sometimes we get fatigued in, in being loving. Sometimes we get fatigued in having compassion. Especially to people that are hard to love. Listen, I worked in the ER. There was a, there was a specific uh, thing that they, they started to talk about towards the end of my time there, and that's this thing called compassion fatigue. And if you work in healthcare or have ever been a part of a, a nurse or whatever, Haley, you've experienced at some level compassion fatigue. And it's really bad in the ER. Why? Because the same people keep coming back and again, and it's the same drunks, it's the same drug seekers, and you're just like, well, they just, I mean, forget it. And you start to become very bitter and jaded towards people. You know, there's such thing as compassion fatigue. There's such thing as caretaker burnout. And there's such thing as, as in a relationship saying, I'm just, I'm done, <laughs> right? I, I'm not, you just do whatever you're going to do. I can't do this anymore. And what God is, 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 what Paul is praying for is that those, in those situations, when we feel like we have nothing left to give, and maybe you've come in this morning and that's where you feel. You're just, you're just done. You're done with people. You're done with anything. My prayer for you this morning is that you'd be strengthened. And notice that he doesn't pray that they would be delivered from their circumstance. He doesn't pray that that person would change. He prays that they would have uh, the, this fullness, that they would be strengthened in their inner being so that they could indeed face whatever they're going to face. It's a different way of thinking about things. Last time you prayed, when you prayed for uh, someone who was hurting or someone who was, who, who was ailing physically, did you pray for their spirit? Did you pray that God would, would be near to their heart, that would give them strength? Because guess what? God can do it, and he will do it. We need to be praying for strength in our inner person. That's number one. What's number two? What's the second thing? And, and I really love this one especially. And this is the one that, that if, you, if you hear nothing else today, that hear this. He prays that, in verse 17, that you, that being rooted and grounded in love, 
may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth. You might say, wait a second, Andrew. What is he talking about here? What is the breadth and length and height and depth? Does he want us to measure something? What are you talking about? Well, yeah, indeed, he does want us to measure something. And that is the love of Christ. He wants us to comprehend the love that Jesus has for us. And if I can get on my knees and pray any one thing, this would be my prayer for you today, that you would get it. That you would understand how much God loves you. And that your life would be so rooted in that love that no matter what came your way, you would find your identity in that. You know, some of us find our identity in being mothers and fathers. But what happens when our kids move out? Some of us find our identities in our jobs. But what happens when the economy turns south and we can't work there anymore? Or what happens when we get too old to be able to work in that spot anymore? We have to find our identity and root ourselves in the love that God has for us. And some of us just, we don't get it. You, you want to know why? You want to know why so many people are leaving the church? You want to know why when, when kids turn 18 and they're not anymore under the, the uh, you know, household anymore, they go off and they don't go to church anymore? You know why? They never knew the love of God. And you know what we do in our churches? We try, we try to just keep them out of trouble. Let's have a bunch of good programs so they can stay out of trouble, so they can come to the youth group. But once they get out, if they didn't know the love of God, they're going to go whatever way they want to go. Are we, are we going to be a people who, who know the love of God? And I pray this morning that you would see the, the perfect love of God that he has for you. Some of you just are living your life trying to make it through. And you're living your life any which way, but you have not experienced the love of God. And that's my prayer. That's Paul's prayer. That you would understand how deep, how wide the love of God is. You know, there's a song that we used to sing when I was in elementary school, right? Deep and wide. Deep and wide, right? And then you'd, 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 you'd sing a couple of choruses and you'd go, hmm, and hmm, right? And you'd, you'd you know, it, it, it not say the words, right? Have we been singing these songs? Have our kids been singing these songs, but never actually experiencing how deep and how wide the love of God is? Have you experienced that love this morning? You're like, Andrew, I don't, I don't think anyone can love me the way that you're talking. I don't think anyone could care for me the way that you're talking. Jesus can. And he does. And you're like, well, how do I know that? You need to look no further than the cross. You know, there was, I think it's a little trite, maybe, and a little gimmicky but the, the church fathers they when they came to this passage they immediately saw the cross because that is where the love of Christ is displayed people who were his enemies and and sinners and and people who deserve to to go to hell for eternity he s stayed on that cross for us and they used to say well what is the height and what is the depth well if you look at the cross, right, that's, there's a beam that, that goes deep. He came down to the depths. He descended lower than angels, Paul says in other places. What is the height? This, this beam pointed up to heaven. There, there's no end to, the, to, to how high God's love is for you. And what is the breadth, right? What is the length? The cross is like this. And the breadth of Christ's love is, is far beyond anything that you can imagine. Have 
you experienced the love of God? Have you experienced it so much that it's changed the very way you live your life? And have you prayed? Here, here's the thing, too. Have you prayed that your family, your friends, the people that you pray for would experience that love, too? You know, instead of praying that, that Johnny would stop drinking, maybe we should start praying that he would just know the love of God. Instead of asking, God, just, just let Paul stop looking at pornography. Maybe we should be praying, God, God, just, just let him know your love for him. We're too quick to jump to, to try to fix everything the behavior when what's wrong with us is the heart. We haven't experienced the love of God. We haven't come to a, re a, I mean, a realization that God loved us so much that he sent his son, his son, to die on our behalf. That is a love that I could never, I mean, as, as a father, I wouldn't let my son die for any of you. I know that's a joke, but I wouldn't. I love you guys. It's my, my love is pretty deep and wide, but hands off my son. I, I might not even die for many of you. But God did. He did both. He sent his son, his only son, and he himself took on flesh. You want to know how much God loves you? You look at the cross. You look at the cross. That's my prayer for you this morning. He goes on to talk about the love of, of God in the next thing that he prays for. There in verse 19, he prays that they would know and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge. What does that mean? How can you know something that surpasses, that's beyond knowledge? I mean, Paul, you, you lost me there. You're, you're crazy. Well, he's not talking about knowing things about the love of God. You know, I can, I can get up here and explain and tell stories about how much God loves you. But until you actually know it, until you've actually experienced it, it's a totally different thing. I can, I can know a lot of facts about lots of people. I, I always end up bringing Megan into my sermons. That's just how it goes. I can, I can know a lot of facts about Megan. I can know that Megan hates Asian food. She, she hates it. She went on a trip when she was young, got turned off, she got really sick on that trip, and so she hates Asian food. Asian food. That's a fact about Megan. Don't ask her to go eat at hibachi with you. She will say, she will say yes, because she's very nice, but she'll, she'll hate it the whole time. Megan is a mom. Megan's my wife. Megan's the admin of this church. Those are a lot of facts about Megan. And you can know a lot of facts about the love of God. You know a lot of facts about someone, but until you actually know them, you haven't actually experienced their presence, experienced who they are, then do you really even know them? Have you so, have you experienced a relationship with God where you've seen him work and you've seen him just change your heart and, and love people that maybe you thought, I can never love that person? Or do things that you thought never could happen? This is, this is what we should be praying for. We should be praying for this for others. That they would know, uh, experientially know God's love, Christ's love. Not that just that they would know a bunch of facts, because we can teach a bunch of facts. You know, a lot, a lot of people actually, when they talk about seminary, you know, seminary is where you go and you get trained to be a pastor. They talk about it, they actually, there's a joke that it, it's like a cemetery. Because many people go to seminary and that's where their faith dies. 
Why? Because they know a bunch of stuff about God. They read a bunch of, of people who wrote a bunch of stuff about God. But were they experiencing God? No, they were not. I praise God for the seminary that I went to. I was aware of this problem. That actually people, professors would stand up in their class and say, I don't care if you know this. You need to know God. And you need to know His love. And professors who would get teared up when they, when they thought about the love of God that, that He has for them. Are you praying that you would know the love of God? I, I pray that for you. And there's one final thing he mentions here, and those things were really great, the things that he's mentioned at this point, but this last one really throws me for a loop. It's there at the end of verse 19. He prays that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. That you would be filled with all the fullness of God. How many of us live our lives empty? Paul here is praying that we would be filled with the fullness, not, not just a little bit, not just a little taste. I mean, all of who God is. And we sit here and we think, well, God, you couldn't possibly do that. I couldn't possibly be filled with your fullness. And yet, God did that very thing when he became man. He, he joined a human being with the fullness of God. And he can do that very thing in our hearts and in our minds. And there's such a power that can come from knowing the fullness, living a spirit-filled, full of God life. You know, I think in our churches so often we, we try so hard to do things to get people in our doors and we look around our doors and we, or look around at, at church and we say, well, that was a good crowd there this morning. That was great. But what truly attracts people to God is not programs and hot dogs as good as they're going to be in just a few minutes. It's people who are full of God. People who are so different, who've, who've been filled so much with the Spirit of God, that people look at them and say, I want that. Whatever they've got, I want it. Right? You, you know, uh, a lot of times when uh, you're, you're at a, well, when people are at a bar or a place to drink and they look over and they some, some guys cutting up and they're having a good time over the, at the table, you'll, you'll make a joke to the waiter, and probably some of you have made this joke, you'll just say, what, I'll have what he's having. That's what we need to be when it comes to the church. We need to be so full of God and so full of his spirit that people look at us and they say, I'll have what he's having. I'll have what she's having. What, whatever whatever they're, they're, they're doing over there, I want that. Can we fill the church with, with doing a bunch of events? Sure, yeah. We can have a, a lot of people here. But will those people really know the love of God? Will they really be people who are walking in his love? That's my prayer. That's my prayer. And he ends with a benediction. And it's going to be the same benediction that will send us off today. And really it gives us, it shows us that he has the ability to do all these things. He has the ability to, to share the love of Christ. He has the ability to, to fill us with his spirit. That he, to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we even ask or think. I mean, it, just what we think, not even just what we ask, what, what we think According to the power at work within us, to him be glory. There's nothing else to say when, when, when God does this. He, it's a work that he does. And this morning, I, I can have the best words, right? I can say the best stories about God's love. But it's God that has to do the work. And so if I've come up here, and, and, and I've been clever, and, and, and I've held my hands out and said, God loves you this much, and all these—it doesn't matter— if God's not working in your heart this morning, it doesn't matter. 
And so I, I want to end my uh, conclude by uh, praying. By praying for you and praying for me that we would know the love of God. And maybe you came into this place this morning and you're like, didn't know, maybe didn't know what to expect, or, or maybe you're like, has Andrew lost his mind? Has he had a little bit too much coffee today? No, I, I just want to know God's love. I want to experience that, and I want that for you. Because guess what? It'll change your life. It'll change the way you work at, look at your circumstances. It'll change the way you pray. It'll change the way you pray for other people. You'll stop being disappointed when, when your grandson or your son or your daughter is not getting it and their behavior is not quite right because you'll be praying for their heart. And watch what God does. Watch what he does when we pray for people to know God's love. Watch what he does. I'm going to take the posture of Paul and I'm going to come right down here and I'm going to pray for you. And I'm going to bow my knees. I pray that you will too. Maybe not in a physical way, because some of us, when we get down, it's, it's going to be hard for us to get back up. I understand that. But bow in our hearts and our minds and ask God for this, to know his love. Let's pray together. Father, I with Paul this morning bow my knees. And God, while you, you, you will listen to anything I say to you right now, because you are my father and I am your son. God, I don't pray for physical healing right now. I don't pray for any of those things that we may normally pray for. I pray simply that your spirit would strengthen the people that were within the sound of my voice. God, whether they're in this room, whether they're watching on a screen, God, that they would be so strengthened to be able to comprehend your love. And I pray that your, your spirit would pour, would pour out from heaven. God, it would change hearts. It would change minds. God, I pray that you would do this work in me. God, I don't think I can ever know the depth and the height and the breadth and the length of your love. But God, show me more. Show us more. God, as we pour our hearts out to you this morning, we ask that you would do more than we even ask right now. More than we could even think. More than we could even imagine. That we would take our church and, and make us a beacon of hope and light in this dark world. Not because of something great that we did, but because of something you did in us. God, work, work. Let your spirit pour out. And I pray for each person that's here. Each child. Each man, each woman, each boy, each girl. That they would know your love. That they would experience your love. And they would come to be in relationship with you. And I pray and ask all of these things in the name of Jesus. And for his sake. Amen. I hope you have enjoyed this virtual service this morning. If you have a prayer need or if you need to talk with someone, uh, please comment below right now. Or you can go on our church website, find our uh, phone number, and I'll be glad to talk with you in any way that I can. Uh, we pray that God would bless you and keep you, make his face shine upon you this week as you go out into this world and love your neighbor and love God. I love you all, and we'll see you next time.